Ori and the Will of the Wisps portrays a pithy and emotional account of an owl who comes to terms with a disability. Then it says, that's how you know it's the second one. There are two trees. From a giant frog to the nameless teddy bear, all NPCs are lovable, squishy critters. After its cutscene-heavy beginning, the game plunges you into agility puzzles whose diversity and pacing will captivate you. While Ori can't fly, he rarely touches the ground, and his constant struggle against gravity makes the acrobatics at least as fun as those in Super Meat Boy. He's raw power with 360-degree precision. Otherwise, the game hits the usual high notes of a strong Metroidvania. Upon your retrieval of an upgrade, your mind will light up with all the paths the upgrades opened. You won't run into active upgrades you won't use. There are lots of them, and they go a long way such that nascent players may find the game to be Byzantine near its end. But it introduces these upgrades so glacially that a distinct area develops your chops with one active upgrade. This isn't to say that the game has a water level where one needs to learn how to use the water upgrade. Nobody likes those. The strength of the area that's home to most of the game's water is that its excellent integration into the rest of the game keeps it from being a water level. Instead of swimming through a stupid big pool, you'll swim through a small pool, jump from it, and traverse several vines over to another pool. Each area that presents an upgrade offers many contexts for you to improve at using that upgrade. For instance, the water level that's not really a water level shows that Underwater Dash is useful as both a weapon and a boost to one's jump. When you leave an area that introduces an upgrade, you can employ that upgrade against obstacles that appear in central, themeless areas. Because half of the active upgrades owe their utility to ubiquitous environmental props, the game demonstrates environmental interaction that many other games address superficially by placing pillars into which a charging boss might crash. If there's sand, you can burrow into it as if to swim. Also, you can deflect off certain obstacles to reset both your double jump and your dash. Ori's relationship with the environment is so intimate that unstable-looking platforms, like tree branches, sink predictably under his weight. Passive upgrades go a long way, too, consisting of extra health or energy containers, equipable trinkets, and extra trinket slots. To obtain all health containers, for example, is to increase one's health from three nodes to twenty. The trinkets are consequential enough to offer a modicum of help, and inconsequential enough such that a bad combination of them fails to impede progress. The game owes the strength of its combat, agility puzzles, and exploration to extraordinary balance. These activities are the perfect difficulty, that is, if you play on normal mode. Bosses might kill you a dozen times, but they won't kill you a hundred times. The same goes for agility puzzles. What I enjoy most about the exploration is that you needn't take a circular route through an area multiple times to ensure you haven't missed upgrades, since you can save in-game currency to buy maps that reveal collectibles. Maps make content more available, but they don't make it easier. Abandoning a gravity-defying agility puzzle because one can't find it is silly in my book. Maybe there are people who prefer to scrub places from top to bottom interminably. I don't. Maps keep you from spending an inordinate amount of time on finding upgrades. Don't buy any maps you don't want, but I had more fun going to specific markers than I would have had while wandering across the game's world several times. The game excels at matching rewards with whatever you accomplish. The more esoteric a challenge or side quest is, the greater your reward upon completion. Main quests, like bosses, produce plenty of in-game currency as well. I especially like the chase scenes in which you'll plan your route as you go. That's something other games don't give you often, and there are more chase scenes in Ori and the Will of the Wisps than there are in the first one. Chase scenes in games are absolute contrivances, but I love them to death, and with any luck, they're your guilty pleasure too. I don't want to say too much about the narrative. I'm serious. That this game's what would happen if one were to expand a children's picture book into a game makes it an emotional experience. Not only will you read a page with eight words on it, but that you'll be on this journey with Ori resonates with the pithiness of a moral preaching children's book. The rampancy of social media ensures that few in today's world experience enough connection. With its band of indomitable critters, this game convinces you that you can leave your home, touch a tree, and feel a strong connection to the past, the future, and the rest of the world. That's amazing. I'm not talking much about the art this time, either. The best pitch I can offer you is to look at it. Look at the art in this game and find me a game with better art. There's great art in games. But none of it compares to the bright, high-contrast acid trip of Ori and the Will of the Wisps. The music is as complex as chopsticks on the piano, but I like it. 
It's good if you like listening to the same song in 15 different ways, which isn't for everyone, but no one can doubt the incredible production quality of sound and music. As this game is a sequel, will you need context? No. I like having the context, but you won't need it to understand the story. When the game begins, you'll see Ori, a chunky beast of feathers, a ball with legs, and a baby owl. The premise is that these characters are a family, a group of friends that's existed since the end of the first game. If you want to learn about how those characters met each other, and why they consider each other family, then knock yourself out with the first game. But I like the second game much more, due to the way it tempers the difficulty of exploration by relinquishing collectibles' locations. Because of how much maps identify, 40% of content isn't likely to remain at the end of the sequel's primary narrative. You may actually do everything there is to do before you reach the final boss, a lot of the time, games usher you to the final boss too soon. Voila, half the game remains, and the post-game's ridden with annoyingly shallow side quests. Each task the game presents is so important and so accessible that you'll want to save the final boss for last. Whatever you'll accomplish makes Ori much more effective against either bosses or platformless agility puzzles. For a proud member of the indie genre, this game's long if you complete most secondary objectives. My last playthrough took me about 12 hours, and a hard mode you'll receive upon normal mode's completion adds some replayability to the game, so you better believe it's $30 on Steam. Again, you'll experience the indie game trifecta of excellent art, music, and gameplay if you put Ori and the Will of the Wisps on your bucket list.